Welcome, everyone. It's great to be here on, st on stage with Dusty and Jim. Thanks for joining us on this Hello. beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Last time I interviewed Dusty was about his book, Kiss the Sky, which he wrote about the 68 uh, Monterey Pops Festival. Maybe we'll touch on that a little bit. Hello, Roger. From the Commonwealth Club of California, this is Climate One, changing the conversation about energy, economy, and environment. I'm Greg Dalton. In 2007, I went to the Arctic on a global warming expedition with scientists and journalists aboard an icebreaker. Experiencing climate change at the top of the world changed my life. When I returned, I created Climate One as a project of the Commonwealth Club. For the last 12 years, I've been interviewing leaders about how burning fossil fuels disrupts all of the systems around us. Our food system, our water system, our ecosystems, our lifestyles, and our economy. Climate changes everything. Today, we're discussing how professional sports can be a player in the climate challenge. Sporting venues and fans getting to games have a large carbon footprint, and athletes have a huge social power. We're joined by three sports leaders. Dusty Baker is a special advisor with the San Francisco Giants. He had a 19-year career as a hard-hitting outfielder with Atlanta Braves and Los Angeles Dodgers. Then a 20-year career as a manager with the San Francisco Giants and some other teams I can't remember. Um. <laughs> I don't think you like those. <laughs> They're all red. <laughs> Uh, joining us from Louisville, Kentucky, R Roger McClendon is Executive Director with the Green Sports Alliance, an association of teams and venues employing sports as a vehicle to promote healthy, sustainable communities throughout the world. He previously served as the first Chief Sustainability Officer with Yum Brands, whose holdings include Taco Bell, Pizza Hut, and KFC restaurants. And Jim Thompson, former lecturer at Stanford Business School and founder of the Positive Coaching Alliance, which trains youth sports coaches around the country. He's also a newly converted climate evangelist. Please welcome them all to Climate One. And to you all. Uh, Dusty Baker, when you were a young boy, you had an encounter with electricity that kind of shaped your life. Um, tell us what you did and what the result of that was. Well, um, what I did was um, I stuck a, a screwdriver in the socket. How'd that work out? Uh, it didn't work out too good, because, <laughs> and it didn't end very well, because when my dad got home, he's like, uh, what happened here? And there was a black soot mark all over the, the socket, and I said, Dad, you know, that famous, <laughs> I don't know. And he goes, uh, well, I'll tell you what, why don't you go get my belt, <laughs> and then maybe this will refresh your memory. And so when he got back, I said, oh, yeah, 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 Dad, I'm, I'm just coming to me now. And, uh, you know, he didn't whip me because he knew I was scared to death uh, uh, by what happened with electricity. And so, like, I was, I was like, uh, uh, marred for life. Uh, I, I was afraid of electricity. And so you're afraid of electricity. And a few years ago, you founded a solar power electric company. So how did that's Well, it's, it's called Baker Energy Team. Actually, I lost a job, I think, uh, with Cincinnati. And so I said, well, I couldn't get a job in baseball. And I said, well, if nobody else wants me on their team. I'll start my own team. <laughs> so I started Baker Energy Team. And, but I had built a home uh, 12, years, uh, 12 years ago, 13 years ago, where um, my project manager is my best friend. And I said, hey, man, you know, I can come up with all these ideas, but I can't really build anything. I'm more of a farmer. I can grow anything. And I said, well, OK, uh, you know, uh, I don't want to pay that $2,500 a month uh, electric bill that, I was going, that my neighbor was paying. So I said, okay, why can't we have a, a, a solar pool? He goes, okay, boom, he drew it up. And I said, okay, I need a solar well that's going to that's gonna irrigate the outside. And he goes, okay, he drew it up. And I says, well, we might not have enough power. Then I had a, a, a ground mount uh, in the back behind my grapes. I had a roof mount on my barn in the carport. And uh, so... Uh, I, I'm not off the grid, but I'm, I'm almost zero and out in energy. And I said, well, the, you know, I think, you know, everybody could use this. So I, so I started studying up on it and, and uh, discovered that, uh, you know, I wanted to leave a, a, a better carbon footprint for my kids and my kids' kids, which I don't have yet, but I'm hoping to have soon. And, uh, you know, to leave a, you know, a better world for them. You also went to a solar energy conference, I thought, and you saw a real lack of, of, um, 
of diversity. Correct. So tell us. Well, about, yeah. you know, I went to um, actually I I was in Chicago and I got I, I met a gentleman in the uh, in the hotel bar. Imagine that. And um, he says, hey, I heard you like the pheasant hunt. And I says, yeah. He goes, I'm from Iowa, but I live in San Diego. And so I says, yeah. He says, well, I want to hunt with you. And so he, he gave me a card. And I said, well, OK, I'll call you. Well, I didn't call him. And uh, then the next year, I was in the same bar in a hotel. And the same guy said, that you're going to call me. So I said, oh, <laughs> here, give me another one. I will call this time for sure. So he says, I'm Ted Roth, you know, uh, you know with Roth uh, Partners. Uh, and he says, come down to our, our conference that we're going to have down in Newport. And I went down there, and I said, wow. And I looked around, and uh, you know, I saw uh, you know, very few uh, uh, minorities. Um, uh, you know, I saw quite a few minorities from, from Japan and, and, and Korea, but you know, very few people that looked like me. And there were also very few women. So I said, so this is, kind of reminds me of, of the high school I went to where there, my family was the only black family in the, in the community and this uh, only blacks in the high school were me and my brother. So I said, you know, we need this as a, as a, as a nation, but we also need to get, uh, uh, you know, minority people more and more involved. And also I was looking for a way to make a living and make a better impact on the world. There's actually the fossil fuel industry actually has more diversity than the clean energy industry. I believe that. Um, Jim Thompson, tell us about your journey from Stanford Business School. You read Bill McKibben, other people have influenced you, and then you recently completed the climate reality training just a week or so ago. So tell us about your journey from Stanford to being a new climate evangelist. Sure. Let me say first, it's a real honor to be on stage with both of you. Dusty's been uh, Positive Coaching Alliance, the organization I started about 20-some years ago. Dusty's been our national advisory board and has been helpful in so many ways. And Greg, you are a member of our leadership council, and um, so really appreciate that. Um, uh, last fall, I told the board after 20 years that I was ready to move out of being the CEO of Positive Coaching Alliance, and um, I asked for a sabbatical, and they gave me one. Uh, and so I've just been reading and studying and talking to people, and the more I, um, the more I learned about the climate crisis, uh, the more depressed I got. Um, it's, uh, it's really way worse than what you read in the papers, or, um, you know, I, I have a Joshua Tree National Park t-shirt on tonight, today, <laughs> um, and I just read a couple days ago, I think it's a UCLA study, it says the Joshua trees, trees are going to go away, mm. that uh, the, the, the mature trees are, uh, will be strong enough to uh, deal with the, the, the droughts coming, but the younger trees won't make it. And so when the existing Joshua trees die out, they're gone. Um, you know, when I was in, in Minnesota for the climate reality training, um, we found out that on Thursday, this number is so big, it's really hard to imagine, 10 billion tons of ice melted in the Arctic on Thursday. And then on Friday, 11 billion tons. And the, the event was at, the, there was a lot of scientists there, one from the University of Minnesota, and somebody's asked him, you know, can this be turned around? And he said, yeah, you know, if we turn everything around, uh, that ice might come back in a thousand years. So uh, the more I learned about it, uh, and then um, the other part of it is, uh, a friend of mine asked me the other day, why is this so important to you? And I said, I've learned a lot from starting Positive Coaching Alliance. We have uh, uh, 18 chapters around the country, uh, $11 million budget. We did almost 3,500 live workshops all around the country last year. So I learned a lot building Positive Coaching Alliance. And I don't know if I can have an impact on the climate crisis, but I feel like I've got to try. I've got to take what I've learned and try to make a difference. We'll get into that. So Roger, um, tell us about your journey from working at Yum Brands to, to the Green Sports Alliance and what you're trying to do there to, to use sports as a lever to get at sustainability. Absolutely, and I appreciate being on the stage with you guys um, and Climate One hosting us. Um, so yeah, so I started with Yum Brands over 24 years ago, and it was a great journey. Obviously, you guys know PepsiCo, uh, it's a great marketing and leadership company, and I um, was really interested in you know how I could impact the company in a bigger way. So I started as an engineer doing some basic uh, equipment design, layout design, and running operations or supporting operations uh, in the calendar in that way. 
And, and something kind of came to mind, you know, when I started looking at how to have a bigger impact in the company. And I brought a proposal uh, to the CEO to talk about what we needed to do as a, as a leader in the space of sustainability. We didn't have the function. We really didn't have the focus. Uh, we were kind of just doing business as usual. And I recognize this was a major um, challenge for the company that would be coming up in generation from generation and primarily around, you know, not only the customers that we serve, but how do we manage the supply chain? You know, what impact, you know, did we have on the community around, you know, common resource availability, like, like fresh water, uh, the quality and food safety of the products that we, that we wanted to provide. And what it showed was we had a major gap in our business. Uh, was risk mitigation, it was brand reputation, uh, and our and our PNL, quite frankly, that we were figuring out how we were going to strategically manage across the globe. Uh, we we're in 146 different countries at the time, building about six restaurants every day around the world. Uh, and so I presented that, you know, proposal to him and he he gladly accepted it and said, you know, um, then you're it. You're this. You're the CSO. You're the Chief Sustainability Officer. And I kind of thought about. It. I was like, oh well, what did I get myself into? You know, kind of like Atlas. You know, what are we going to do now? Uh, and so the first thing, like, has been talked about on the stage was education, um, becoming aware of what was going on. And the real genius of really making anything work is around innovation. Um, and so if you can get collaboration, innovation, and kind of put that together. Um, I think you can solve some of these challenges that we had. So quickly uh, freshened up, you know, my knowledge uh, about this, this subject and, and started working with our supply chain, working with our general managers, understanding the business case and translating the language of climate into the language of, of, of real language of corporations and business. Um, and it could be that translation of reducing your and mitigating your environmental impact and carbon reduction actually translated into value for the company. Um, worked that strategy all the way up to the highest levels of our stakeholders, which included our board of directors, our large institutional shareholders, asset, you know, folks like uh, BlackRock uh, that held large shares of our company and talked about this strategy that we could implement to make ourselves a better company. Um, we also worked with marketing as well to talk about what we were doing at a local level to engage the community and engage our customers and so really was a very unique opportunity at the time to bring all our brands, franchisees, and our supply chain together for a common good. Uh, what we were able to do was to build over uh, five to 6,000 restaurants in a short period of time that what we call lead certifiable. So we used the United States Green Building Council standards, created our own called Blue Line to make it work across the globe, uh, integrated that with the China development schedule, the Australian development schedule, UK tested these technologies and brought it to life in the form of reduced energy usage, water usage to the tune of about 30%, and it provided value back to our, to our shareholders and to our customers that we were able to tell the story of, to. So um, I retired and, you know, we ended up hitting the Dow Jones Sustainability Index for two years in a row. We were um, looked at uh, by, by CSR Magazine, a Corporate Social Responsibility Leader, uh, Top 100, um, and so I felt really good about that and, you know, kind of went into my retirement mode, started working uh, on a local level with a, um, a, a national high school basketball program, a prep school. Mm -hmm. And I got this phone call from the Green Sports Alliance. And I, I kind of heard about them, but I was like, OK, what's better than, you know, having food and sustainability? Because I love to eat, you know, and I have to be honest, I love KFC, <laughs> pizza, <and> Taco Bell. <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> but what's better than, than uh, from my roots and upbringing, what was better than doing that work was really joining the Green Sports Alliance and combining sports and sustainability. Um, and it got me back to my roots. And I'm a huge fan, Dusty, you know, and, and obviously I love this, you know, this, um, you know, thinking about um, what we need to do with young athletes and young people around leadership and leadership development and, you know, what we need to do to help encourage them to, to reach their potential is all part of, you know, the DNA. But to take sport and sustainability with Green Sports Alliance and being in the role in six months, you know, we have a huge opportunity um, to take sports and influence. And, you know, through the words of Muhammad Ali, and I live in Louisville, Kentucky, between, you know, Colonel Sanders and Muhammad Ali, you know, through sport, we have in food, we have a huge opportunity to influence right. the world in a positive way. And some of the stats about the issue of climate 
risk is real. Um, the impact that we're going to have, we don't really even know how to, to measure you know, at this point, but we know we need to react. So my goal with the Green Sports Alliance, working with ESPN, Major League Baseball, you know, Major League Football, NFL, uh, USTA, all the sports teams together is to challenge, ch channel that energy and that influence for positive gain uh, for humanity uh, in short. And I'm really pleased to be a part of this uh, panel and to talk about how we do that. Like many professional sports organizations, the National Hockey League has its own green initiatives. They're working to reduce the carbon footprint of their stadium operations and dealing with a legally mandated phase-out of a refrigerant that's been used for decades to maintain indoor ice rinks. But the NHL also faces a more existential threat from the warming climate, the disappearance of frozen lakes and ponds. We spoke to Omar Mitchell, the NHL's Vice President of Sustainable Infrastructure and Growth Initiatives, about the future of outdoor hockey. Ice hockey is very unique compared to any other sports. Think about baseball, football, basketball that don't require as much infrastructure. You need a field, you need a court. Our sport in particular needs ice. And if you're playing outdoors, we require natural ice, which means we need cold weather and we need fresh water. NHL players, ice hockey players, some do grow up playing on frozen ponds, playing on their uh, backyard ice rinks that they flooded. This is an inherent part of our sport and we wanna make sure that that heritage continues. We are seeing that with changing climates, it is impacting natural ice conditions. Rinkwatch has estimated that in the next decades, weather conditions will adversely impact natural ice conditions in Eastern Canada. Potentially, it could hold true for other parts of Canada and other parts of the US, especially in the northern climates. And so we wanna make sure that we can use our platform at the NHL to tell the story of why this should matter for fans and ultimately educate them and inform them on what they can do so that they can reduce their carbon footprint and lower their environmental impact. This is not about politics. This is not about whether you believe in, you know, any of the issues that our um, environment is facing. This is all about the sport. Folks who play hockey intuitively understand why this is important for the game. If we can educate our millions of fans, those are the millions of fans that if they just adopt one thing in their life, in their house, in their schools, that's where you're going to have significant impact. That was Omar Mitchell, the NHL's Vice President of Sustainable Infrastructure and Growth Initiatives. So Roger McClendon, that looks like some pretty serious challenges there for National Hockey League. Are they lead, what, how are they translating that into uh, sustainability initiatives? Because this is not just a luxury for them. This is the core threat for their, for their sport. Yeah, from Commissioner Betts to Kim Davis to, to Omar, those, that leadership team at the top really take this seriously. Uh, and they're doing things about it. So from technology that we talked about with the LA Kings on, you know, how we reduce our energy usage and, you know, have a better ice rink environment, you know, to leverage that technology and then share it across, you know. So that's something internal when you think about sustainability 1.0 is what you can do within your operations to make an impact. Uh, and then we talked about sustainability 2.0 is fan engagement. But when it comes to bigger areas of impact, it talks about policy change and what you have to do at the higher order. That's where we need the support of everyone to take this you know, to the next level. And NHL is leading in that. They were the first sports team to take it and, and do a full sustainability report. Uh, so they are leaders in their right. And you know, obviously they're the most affected right now, um, but they are leading the way and we appreciate that leadership. Dusty Baker on the idea of sports getting into policy and politics. Well, you know, I'd like to add uh, th that I went uh, to a couple events and I urge everybody to um, to get behind the Green Sports Alliance. I went to an event in Atlanta at the um, at the football stadium there and mm -hmm. I and I met a young man there, um, Shane Keel, that's the son of a uh, a former player, Matt Keo, with the A's. That was my my buddy for a long, long time. It just shows you how old I'm getting. <laughs> and uh, and then I went to an event in Coronado, 
if, you know, for the Green Sports Alliance. And, 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 and Near San Diego? Yes, and, you know, that was probably one of the best events that I'd been to. There were a lot of college uh, 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 coaches there, uh, uh, a lot of minor league facilities there. And so I, I think people are becoming more and more aware of, of the challenges that we're facing. And also, uh, you know, the fact that, you know, it's going to take some financing. It's going to take some money to, you know, to get behind this. So I urge everybody, uh, you know, that's listening to this to get behind the Green Sports Alliance. Great. The NBA's Portland Trailblazers are one team that going outside its venue to shape fan behavior. Octavia Chambers manages the team's Live Greener Challenge and says the team is focused on life outside the stands. I spoke with her earlier. Yeah, so for us, our, we really focus on our sphere of influence. So what can we do to positively impact the folks that are around us and the folks that people think that they may not have the authority to impact? Um, so really kind of changing the frame of the way people think about things. And so for us, it was really important to not only just have our sustainability goals internally um, and talking about things we're going to do within our organization, but also to inspire that behavior change in our fans because our fans are within our sphere of influence and then their communities are within their sphere of influence. And so you had this challenge, you had about a thousand participants in 35 states. Tell us what they did. Yeah, so each of these folks had to commit to doing at least a couple of different actions during the month of April um, to help reduce their carbon footprint. So it could be like they didn't, they did a, like a no waste mill, they um, decided to carpool, they rode their bike, um, any like small thing that someone could do to um, reduce their carbon footprint, they were asked to do in that challenge. And then was there an incentive where they, they get a, a, a trailblazer jersey? What, was this a game? Or what was the incentive other than being a virtuous good person? <laughs> so there were those. <laughs> and then there was also an opportunity to win a signed Damian Lillard jersey, a team signed ball, tickets to a game. We had a whole bunch of different like, posters and player cards um, and different things that folks could win throughout the whole challenge. So it wasn't just who um, won at the end. There were also challenges each that folks could win a prize for. A lot of companies and sports franchises are afraid of alienating their fans. Has that been a concern at all, that you're wading into a political arena and that might be bad for the team or bad for the business? Well, our mission is to positively impact um, communities that have been historically underserved where they live, learn, and play. And we see this as being a part of where folks live. And so it's definitely not political. It's about humanity. The Live Greener Challenge spoke to our principles of Living Greener, and one of them is inspiring behavior change in fans. And so folks realizing that that is one of our principles, um, and that may be different from different corporations where they are so more so focused on that internal aspect, but a part of us leveraging the power of sport to really drive change, um, we have to make sure that we also look externally. And so anything that we do, we usually have that external component written in. So this is not just about entertainment and having a good time. You're saying that the Trailblazers is about social change. Yes, definitely. That's Octavia Chambers, Social Responsibility Impact Manager for the Portland Trailblazers. Roger McClendon, the idea of uh, you know sports, obviously multi-billion dollar corporations, huge industry, getting involved in uh, shaping fan behavior and getting involved in social and political issues. We've had a lot of controversy around that in this country from Kaepernick to others. Um, you know, but what you're saying and the Trailblazers are saying, these teams need to get involved in policy to solve this climate problem. Is that how are they approaching that? They really nervous yeah, about it? Yeah, it's well, it's a slippery slope for some, but I think there's are these are issues that have been around for a long time, and you can't separate the environmental from the social. You you really can't. So when we think about what is the proper framework to have this dialogue, it, it really is at the United Nations level with the Sustainable Development Goals, which integrate the social and the environmental together. And out of those 17 goals, you know, 12 of them relate to climate change. Some is gender equality, poverty. Uh, you know, um, water quality, those kind of things. But when you think about what does that mean for a business, you know, and, and re believe it, you know, Portland Trailblazers, these, these NBA teams, they are, they're businesses, but they have the, the responsibility to serve their consumers and their consumers are fans, you know. Um, and the, if the fans stop watching, if it's not in their best interest because they're not taking care of their environment and being responsible or the social side, they can go away. You know, <laughs> so I think that's the power that the fans have is to, you know, put the pressure back on to the sports teams and really have a very authentic 
conversation around the social and the environmental issues that I think they can they can move forward in a positive, positive way. Jim Thompson, you know a lot of national sports leaders in basketball, Phil Jackson, you know, all, all sports across the country. Do they talk about climate? Do you talk about climate with them? Or do they view that as some something separate from their career and their business? Yeah, I haven't had many conversations with uh, the various coaches and athletes that support Positive Coaching Alliance, but I'm going to. Um, Dick Lamb was a former governor of Colorado, and he spoke at the Stanford Business School, and I worked there. I, I brought him to speak to my students, and he had this great framework for policy change. There are four stages you have to go through. The first is no talk, no action. Nobody's talking about it. Nobody's doing anything because they don't even realize it's a problem. Second stage is talk, no action. This is frustrating for activists because it's like, well, nobody's doing anything, just talking about it. But his point was that's a stage you have to go through. Third stage then is talk, action. People continue to talk about it, keep acting. And then the fourth stage is no talk, action. You know, if you think about drunk driving, people don't talk about that anymore. You drive drunk, you go to jail. It's, it's not a... Settled, yeah. You don't have to talk about it anymore. I, I want to say, too, also, I'm, I'm eager to see this, this uh, thing about talking because I think we do need to uh, enlarge the conversation. And one of the things I'm, I am going to be working on is talking with, with uh, all the contacts I have in professional sports and college sports. Um, people need to hear about climate change. We need to be talking about... It. This is... Uh, I heard... Um, Bill McKibben and Al Gore say things like, this is the biggest issue of our age. They're wrong. This is the biggest issue of the history of humanity. This is so big, and we got to start talking about it. Dusty Baker, you're a hunter and an angler. When you're out there on the land, can you see the changes? And do you talk about climate change with your hunting and fishing buddies? Well, you know, I'm 70 years old, and I came up hunting and fishing with my dad. And uh, so I, I was raised on the American River in Sacramento. I've seen the, uh, you know, the salmon population go down. I've seen, uh, I've fished all over the country. Uh, I've seen the acid rain lakes of, of, uh, of the northwest. I'm sorry, of the northeast. Mm -hmm. I fished Lake Mille Lacs where they were in Minnesota. was one of the best, <laughs> I know you do, was one of the best uh, 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 fisheries around. And they... You know, you couldn't take a, you know, fish out of there. I just came from um, Alaska and, uh, you know, where, where the king salmon population is down in Alaska, where all the Indians and, 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 and people depend on those things. And, uh, 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 you know, the climate was, uh, you know, the temperature was 90 degrees. And they said the week before it was it hit a record of 92 degrees. And, and I just couldn't, you know, I had heard about these things, uh, about... Fifteen years ago, I went fishing at the McLeod Conservancy, mm -hmm. and there was a scientist there and his wife, both of them were scientists, and they were talking about the glaciers that were melting. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I thought they were probably exaggerating. But then when I went there uh, just last week, you know, there were waterfalls everywhere in the middle of the summer of the glaciers melting. Now, I don't know how, if they're there all the time, because that was my first time there. But, uh, you know, I can really see the change. I can see the change in the, you know, the pheasant and the duck populations when I go because I'm a bird hunter. And so, uh, you know, during this course of time, you know, there are no more wild birds. Uh, um, now they're all uh, planted birds. And, and, you know, I'd rather not hunt those. You yeah. know, you, you got to go to North Dakota or South Dakota to find, uh, you know, wild birds. So I really see a difference. Um, I'm also big into... Uh, you know, water purity, you know, um, and, and uh, you know, having, having clean, drinkable water for, you know, for our kids and our future. Does that make you sad when you go up there? I mean, there's a lot of yeah. sort of sadness. What do you do with that sadness? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, pass a message. You know, when I hear people talking about there's no uh, global warming, there's no climate change, and that's, and that's, that's false. I mean, I, I think we need to do something about it and do something about it right now and not just blame China or different com uh, countries. We have to, it's a global problem. It's, it, it's not China, it's not the United States, it's, it's everybody because we breathe what they do, they breathe what we do. And so, uh, you know, we just have to find a way. Uh, like I said, I want my kids to enjoy some of the things that, you know, I enjoyed as a kid. and. Uh, you know, I've been called a nature boy, and I'm trying to raise my son as a, you know, to be a nature boy. But, uh, but you definitely need nature, you know, for them to enjoy. 
If you're just joining us, we're talking about green sports and professional sports and climate change with Roger McClendon from the Green Sports Alliance, Dusty Baker, former pro player and manager, and Jim Thompson, founder of the Positive Coaching Alliance, which trains people around the country. I'm Greg Dalton. Um, Dusty Baker, what's the role of, we live in a, you know, a celebrity-focused culture. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the role of, of professional athletes speaking out on something like this? You know, we, it gets, we've seen you know, different athletes come out and touch on social issues. Might be right. guns, might be education, uh, race issues. Uh, but we don't see many pro sports athletes coming out talking about climate or environment. Well, I don't think that they're asked those questions, number one. I think somebody mm -hmm. needs to... Uh, you know, to prompt the questions uh, out of them, because I don't think most people are going to just come out and just start talking about climate change. Uh, right. You know, I think that, uh, uh, you know, the athletes have a big time following. Sure. And you don't even know how many people pay attention to you uh, or, or what you say. And, and I didn't pay attention while I was in the game. I got people coming to me all the time. So, oh man, I love this interview that you were talking about with Renell. I love this that you said on social media. And see, you don't really have an idea the impact that we have on people. Uh, and like I said, I'm, I'm proud to be 70 years old. You can you can tell. But <laughs> you know, you know, when I see kids that uh, now they're 40 years old and they're telling me what an impact I had on them at their junior high school or or their elementary schools that does you help you know put me in a direction just like somebody helped put me in the proper direction to get to where I am now I'd say that whatever athletes care about, a lot of athletes have an issue. You know, for Steph Curry, it's uh, it's mosquito nets, right? Yeah. Well, mosquitoes are more dangerous and and prevalent in a warmer world. So so climate change is a mosquito. Well, issue. I just came from Alaska. They have like. Something ridiculous, 32 different mosquitoes or something like that. And then the mosquitoes. And they're, and they're growing and they're oh, coming. Yeah. So, Roger McClendon, why don't we see, you know, you're part of talking to all these different uh, teams across different sports. Where are the athletes? Where are the celebrity voices? It's one thing to say we're going to have clean energy in the stadium and compost, et cetera. But it's another to have the, uh, the people with the real power, the athletes, get out there and, and message on this. We haven't really seen that. Why? Yeah, yeah, I think it's a it's a challenge for us. We do have some leadership, you know, OV and you know some other folks that I can mention, you know, that may have been uh, in the sport and at the time, you know, they become passionate about it. But as they're far and few in between, um, we have a huge opportunity to kind of relate what we're doing with some of their cause and purpose. Uh, and I think we talked about it, you know, from on on this stage is we have to go broader. Um, and we have to engage the athletes where they are. And I think as we explain and help them understand, I think more, more athletes will jump on board and take this up as a cause. Um, so there's a lot of work to do in that space. Yeah, I think it's a lot of, you talked, Roger, earlier about bridging language, climate language to corporate language. Mm -hmm. I've had conversations with Steve Kerr a little bit. I interviewed him during a climate summit a few years ago that a lot of his players are concerned about urban violence. Well, we know one of the strongest statistical data sets of data we know is that when temperatures rise, violence rise. There's more people honking their horn. There's more fights at ballparks. There's more violence. People get cranky when it gets hot. So there's more, all kinds of violence between countries. There's, uh, you know, uh, spousal abuse goes up, domestic violence goes up. So if you care about violence, you care about climate because when it gets hotter, people get cranky and, and they start to fight. Jim Thompson. Yeah, um, the, I think the, the way to think about climate, the climate crisis is that it's uh, a threat multiplier. Uh, a lot of talk now about um, uh, immigrants on the border, and, and my daughter-in-law was down in uh, Mexico on the border this past weekend uh, volunteering. It's, it's a really tough situation. I, don't, I can't remember a single time in the mainstream media where there was a connection. People are coming from Guatemala because they can't make a living anymore. There's a drought there. So uh, the, the, whatever issue we're interested in, climate change is going to make that issue worse. We've got to... And, and I wanted to say something. There's, there's a, a couple of times it's been said, you know, this isn't political. Um, you know, uh, during the Second World War, people had victory gardens. Victory Gardens did not win the Second World War. I like to think about my mom was a Rosie the Riveter. She worked in San Diego uh, making bomber doors. Um, there was a, uh, I call it a toasters to tanks. 
there was a mobilization that our factories stopped producing consumer goods and started producing war goods. And I think we need the kind of mobilization, this issue is so big, we need the kind of mobilization bigger than Second World War, and we're not gonna get that without uh, political change. The difference was, though, in World War II, there was a villain with a human face, mm -hmm. right? We had Hitler and Mussolini, Japan. So in climate, we're all conflicted, Dusty Baker, because we're part of the problem. We can blame China or blame the oil companies, but we're, all, and so we're part of the, if North Korea was, was causing climate change, we'd probably be doing that, but we're causing it. And that's hard. That well, we're helping it. We're helping it, right? Mm -hmm. We're partly part of it. Uh, um, I, I think, I think it, we're going down a ro wrong road if we say we're all responsible for this. There are people, the fossil fuel companies, for example, the leaders of that, they are producing, um, I, you know, they're producing the equivalent of Hiroshima bombs into the atmosphere on a regular basis. Um, that has to stop. We've got to keep oil in the ground. Uh, and, uh, you know, all due respect, Greg, I think that saying we all are responsible for this uh, is not accurate. We, We've got to figure out how to, how to fix the situation. We have a responsibility to do that. But um, if everyone in this room and everybody who listens to this and sees this uh, gets solar energy on their house and buys an electric car, it's, that's great, but it's not going to solve the problem. It's got to be done on a much bigger basis. Right. Those things, everything we do is necessary and insufficient. Whatever it's, you know, solar, going vegan, et cetera, it's important to do, and we all need to do more. It makes it very overwhelming. Um, I'm going to go to our lightning round and ask some true or false questions of our guests. Um, true or false, Dusty Baker, you once smoked a joint with Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> <laughs> true. <laughs> I was 18. <laughs> uh, true or false, uh, Roger McClendon, reducing meat consumption is one of the biggest actions a person can take to reduce their climate impact. True. Mm. That means fewer trips to Taco Bell, KFC, or Pizza Hut. <laughs> but no, let me, let me qualify that. We do have a vegan option. You can still come see us at Taco Bell, you know, and we have a vegan, vegan. substitution. <laughs> yeah, when he goes to the, when he goes to KFC, does he eat vegan chicken? <laughs> so great. Uh, Burger King has uh, has Possible. Impossible Burgers now. Yeah, yeah, so absolutely. I, okay. I, I, I actually am a vegan, but and and don't miss it at all, meat at all. But uh, people don't have to become vegans. Right. You can you can eat less meat. Um, you know, years ago, people would have a, a big uh, steak or a roast or something on Saturday night dinner. They didn't, eat, they didn't eat meat three meals a day. And so we can move in the direction of eating less meat. Uh, people don't have to become vegan. Does it have to be all or nothing? Uh, true or false, Jim Thompson, you admire Al Gore. Yes, true. Uh, it, also for Jim, if he had really fought, he could have become president. I believe that's true. Mm. Uh, Dusty Baker, true or false, after this Climate One conversation, you will find a way to talk about climate change more around uh, baseball players and fans. True. Uh, Roger McClendon, true or false, the NBA is the most socially progressive pro sports league in the country. I think so. And I think their leadership inside, you know, the NBA, especially LeBron James, I'd have to call him out. You know, he's doing a lot to help with social issues in the community. So I, I think they do have the kind of the bones uh, to kind of support that that movement. Uh, true or false, Dusty Baker, when it comes to hiring and firing skippers for Major League Baseball, black managers get no look or a quick hook. Both are true. Uh, association. You don't want uh, me to elaborate, but that's <laughs> I know you've been there twice. <laughs> um, this is an association. Uh, Dusty Baker, your favorite band that you saw perform at the 1968 Monterey <laughs> Pops Festival? Hmm. My favorite band was probably Jimi Hendrix. Jimi Hendrix. Um, Dusty wrote a book about called Kiss the Sky about his mother gave him when he was 18 years old, gave him two tickets to Monterey Pops where he saw... That was my uh, graduation present and the use of the Rambler station wagon and 20 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> and we showered on the beach and act like we were coming out of the water. <laughs> so we didn't stink. Uh, Dusty Baker, your favorite park in professional baseball other than the one that currently employs you? <laughs> mm. uh, well, it's not going to be popular around here, but Dodger Stadium. 
uh, <laughs> hey, see, I told you. I preface it. <laughs> Jim Thompson, if you could convert one sports star to a climate evangelist, who would that be? Uh, well, I'm going to answer twice. Uh, uh, it would be great to have some, uh, an athlete like uh, LeBron James and a coach like, um, like Steve Kerr. Roger McClendon, uh, your favorite venue for watching professional sports? I, I think LA Live. I love that whole new re re remodel there. And it just for the community, I love that, that atmosphere. So the old Coliseum probably was my most favorite because of the energy in there. But uh, I think LA Live is a nice, nice little vacation. Also for Roger, one pro sports owner who's a true leader on sustainability and climate. I, I think Arthur Blank uh, for, you know, he owns, you know, uh, Atlanta United, you know, the new soccer team there along with the Atlanta Falcons. I think he's just all around engaged socially and environmentally. What they de did with the investment to have a lead platinum facility with the Mercedes Benz Stadium is incredible. So he didn't have to make that additional, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of investment to get the lead platinum. But he did because of what it means for the for the environment and the community. Last one. Dusty Baker, you have companies that make wine and electricity. Which one is more fun? Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> probably making wine because, you know, I'm a grape grower as well. And uh, I'm a farmer. I mean, I got a winter crop and a summer crop. And, uh, you know, I enjoy, I enjoy farming. Salt of the earth. Let's give them a round of applause for getting through the... Uh, Jim Thompson, your organization uh, coaches uh, volunteer and parent coaches around the country, youth sports, teaching them character. Why is that important in a, in a hot and destabilized world, sort of youth sports, that what's taught there? Well, uh, our kids and their kids are going to be challenged uh, in ways that we have not been challenged. Uh, um, food shortages, uh, epidemics, droughts, floods. Um, Doing, the right, doing sports the right way is more important now than ever, that we have to help kids become the kind of people. We spend a lot of time as adults uh, trying to get kids to do certain things. What if we spend our time trying to encourage them to become the kind of people who want to do the right thing? Um, our country, the whole world, is going to need leaders. You mentioned that before, but Dusty. People who um, do the right thing when it matters. That's my definition of character. When you do the right thing when it matters, and what happens in the next 10 years matters a lot. Right. Roger McClendon, we've seen some um, uh, athletes speak up on, on social issues before. You think about, you know, shut up and dribble, which uh, Laura Ingram said about LeBron James <laughs> saying she doesn't want to hear about politics from a man paid $100 million a year to bounce a ball. Uh, what are some of the, the, the social barriers to athletes stepping out on climate? Because we live in such a polarized era where this climate is, is, can be political. It shouldn't be, but it is. Well, it shouldn't be political, and, and every person, you know, based on this country and democracy and what we call freedom, you know, freedom of, of our opinions, uh, that, that, that's the right that we all have, regardless of how much money you make or what, you know, what job you have. So the fact that athletes can have an opinion and should have an opinion and choose to voice it, they have that right. Um, and we know there's some challenging issues that we face in this country that are not, you know, just didn't happen yesterday. They're systemic. And so this combination between social and environmental kind of integrate and, you know, they, 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 they build on each other. Um, so, no, I, I applaud those young uh, athletes like LeBron James and, and others that take a position uh, and stand by it, uh, and they should continue to do so. Is the sustainability reaching down into college sports level? We've talked mostly about pro sports here, Roger. What's happening at the college sports level, which is that, you know, that obviously the next generation? Yeah, absolutely. We're, you know, our, our kind of theme and tagline for the next decade, and we're, we're going to be coming up on a decade year old at our next summit at the U.S. Bank Arena in Minneapolis, is around what we call playing for the next generation uh, and leveraging the sustainable development growth framework to, to really manage, you know, our focus and what we're going to try to, to, to impact. Um, so, yeah, I, I believe that if we can focus on youth and youth engagement, which has been talked about on the stage climate action, you know, not just talking about it, what can we do? Uh, and then infrastructure, you know, around 
um, smart city and smart city development, where we're looking talking about closed loop and regenerative systems, where we're actually pulling carbon out of the atmosphere to improve our situation. So I think we have to leverage that technology and these frameworks to really drive action to, that's, that's impactful. And the more I talk about uh, climate, Roger, the more out power comes up. Who has power? Who, who doesn't have power? The NBA structure, where the players have a little more power in the NBA, they're more progressive, whereas tell us about the NBA versus the NFL, which seems to be lagging when it comes to social issues and certainly sustainability. Yeah, yeah. And Dusty may have some insights based on, you know, understanding that that, that ownership level and, you know, how much flexibility mm -hmm. you have to kind of step out there. Um, you know, no, I do think the, the NBA, because of the player, the, the players association and, you know, their player bargaining, they, they do have a little bit more um, leverage. Um, and I think it kind of moves, you know, further with le lower leverage as you move up to some of the other leagues. Uh, and it becomes difficult to, you know, maybe take a position at times when you think you might lose your job. <laughs> Dusty Baker, your thoughts on that? Well, you know, the difference between I see basketball and, and football is that, you know, one player on your starting five is 20% of your team. And so, therefore, if something happens to uh, your starting player, it's going to have much more impact on your mm -hmm. team than a, a football team that has 50 players that you can sort of do with, without a player unless he's a mega player. Mm -hmm. And, uh, um, you know, it's quite a, it's, it's, it's quite a challenge for, for the athletes uh, especially when you spend all your life trying to get to this goal and you realize uh, it's a very limited uh, you know, period of time. And, and also there's somebody always trying to take your job. So I admire the guys that, mm -hmm. you know, that step out there that you know, are willing to risk you know, what their lifelong goals have been. Uh, but, but as you said earlier, you know, I think the NBA is much more aggressive. Uh, the, the players have more power in the NBA, which a lot of people, uh, you know, resent the fact that how much power the players in the NBA have compared to, you know, the football players. If you're yeah. just joining us, we're talking about pro sports and sustainability with Climate One with Dusty Baker, Jim Thompson, and Roger McClendon. Uh, discussing climate at, at a sporting event or anywhere can be challenging. The Alliance for Climate Education teaches high school students around the country how to broach that heavy topic. Here are their secrets for talking climate with anyone of any age. Talking about climate change can be tough. I mean, it's not like something you can just casually bring up in conversation. But it's such a big, important topic. We can't just ignore it. And while you can't fix climate change all by yourself, you do have the power to affect the people in your life. So let's talk more about climate change. Here's how. First, think about all the things you want to say about climate change. And don't say them. Really. You see, if you just start going off on how bad climate change is, people are probably going to shut down. They may feel attacked and put up their guard. It doesn't matter how eloquent your words are. If the other person's not listening, there's no point. So here's the secret to talking about climate change. Listen. Listen to the other person. I know it sounds weird, but it's the most important part. You may think the goal is to convince the other person of your perspective, but that's going about it all wrong. The goal is just to have an actual conversation, and that only happens when people listen. So how do you start? First of all, don't ambush people. Get permission first. If they're busy, no need to force it. Just try again another time. Distractions make talking hard, so it's okay to ask to shut devices off. Once you have their attention, start with a question about climate change. Remember to make it about them, not you. Ask about their thoughts and their perspective. When they start speaking, you have one job. Just listen. Resist any urge to respond right away. And whatever you do, don't interrupt. This might be the hardest part, especially if you have strong feelings or if the other person is saying something that you disagree with. But trust me on this. Just listen and be open to what they're saying. Now, if the other person doesn't say much, that doesn't mean you can go, okay, they're done, my turn. It's not your turn until you learn something about the other person. So encourage them to say more by asking follow-up questions. Ask about personal experiences. No need to go into science or politics. Reflect back what you hear them say. 
Repeating and referring to their words lets them know that you are listening, that you care about their point of view. This makes them feel valued and safe. When you earn their trust, they will be more willing to open up and listen to you. So after they've shared their perspective, then ask if you can tell them about yours. Okay, now it's your turn. What will you say? Remember, the point is not to convince the other person of anything. If you try to do that, they may become defensive and stop listening. Just share what you personally think about climate change. You may not be a climate expert, but you are the expert on yourself. So tell your story. When did you start caring about climate change? What worries you the most? After you're done talking, ask what they think. Bring it back to them. And you guessed it, listen. That's what a conversation is, a two-way exchange of ideas. Go back and forth for as long as it feels right. Learn from one another. At the end, thank them for talking and say what you learned from them. This is important. Ending on a positive note makes it more likely that this conversation will happen again. You see, one little chat may not change anyone's life, but it opens the door to more climate conversations in the future. And that's how you build trust. Get others caring about climate change and make a long-term impact. You may be surprised how much you learn in the process too. So what are you waiting for? Talk to someone about climate change. It may be one of the most important things you do. Those are tips on how to talk about climate from the Alliance for Climate Education. Jim Thompson, you wanna expand this, the conversation on climate, include people in professional sports who don't often talk about climate. Your reaction to that video. I love it, yeah. Um, the, um I think, you know, it's, it, uh, people, people feel like I have to be an expert to say something about it. And mm -hmm. um, there's so much now that's, that's leaking through into the media about climate change. And an easy way to do it is to, um, is to say, you know, I just read about Joshua trees going away or, you know, all this uh, water, this ice melting, you know, and, and I'm kind of concerned about it. What do you think? Um, and there's a... Uh, Malcolm Gladwell wrote an article in The New Yorker a couple of years ago about um, a threshold theory. They were looking at it in terms of looting. You know, there was civil dis disturbance, and some people have a threshold of zero. They're the first person to go in and loot something. Somebody might have a threshold of 100. They, they don't do something until 99 people there. Uh, and they, then they do. Some people might have, you know, a, a billion or, you know, never. Um, I think there's a similar thing going on with climate change, mm -hmm. that when people hear about it, they hear about it here, they hear about it there, and it doesn't have to be convincing. It's just they're hearing about it. Oh, this is really something. And that threshold then hits. And, and you, you mentioned to me a while back Catherine Hayhoe, who's a climate scientist, I think at Texas Tech. Mm -hmm. uh, she comes from an a, a evangelical Christian background. And she has a concept, which I love, which is trusted messenger. So she speaks to groups that, like she came out of. You know, Dusty, you're a hunter and a fisherman. Um, we've, that we, we all need to find who are the trusted messengers to, to talk about this. And then lots and lots of conversations. Dusty Baker, your thoughts, reaction to that, to that uh, piece. And also, do you ever feel like you're reluctant to, to mention climate? Because either it's, it's complicated or it's, it's controversial. You just kind of keep... Zip your lips. Well, no, I, I, it's hard for me to zip my lips, I guess. But <laughs> you know, you know, I never feel uh, any pressure about being controversial because, uh, like I said, I've lived it, and mm -hmm. so I'm not talking out of a magazine or out of a book. I'm talking out of out of reality, and uh, I'm talking out of you, you know. You can feel it, you know, and I think uh, a lot of people feel it. Uh, like I said, I just came from, you know, from Alaska in Sacramento, you know, like our, our winters are shorter, our summers are longer, or, or wherever you're from, you know, your springs are, are short and your falls are short. And, uh, and I think yeah. the more people that can talk about it that have lived it and felt it, uh, you know, th th this is a way to give a warning to those that haven't lived it or felt it. And, uh, you know, communication is getting harder and harder, you know, because I have a I have a, a young 20 year old and, you know, communication, you know, they're always on on the, on some on some machine. Device, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, some device. I mean, we were in um, uh, um, Sea of Sky Highway in Vancouver and I told my son, I, I said, look out the window. He goes, well, you know, what am I going to look at? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, just look out the window. And I had a convertible. It was beautiful. And, uh, and he looked out the window. 
and Esau and Eagle come down and, and grab a, a trout uh, out, of the, out of the water. And he goes, Dad, I wouldn't have seen that, you know, had I been, you know, I call it his machine, yeah. you know. And, I, and he goes, uh, Dad, uh, you know, thank you so much. And see, he huh. went with me to Alaska, you know, just not necessarily to fish, but he went with me just to, just to see. And, right. and, you know, see what the world's about and see what's out there. And it's a beautiful, beautiful world that we're about to screw this thing up. And it's going to be, uh, they're talking about, you know, we need another ice age. Well, if we need another ice age, well, none of us are going to be here. So, you know, I think it's about education of the young. And the more we can get the young people involved, because it's going to be their world. You know, we're going to be out of here. And so uh, that, that's what I think is very, very important to get the young people involved. You think it's scary to talk to them about really how how serious it is? Uh, no, um, you know, I mean, I was scared straight on some things, and 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 most of the time I was scared straight on reality, and uh, and and to me, I'm I'm not about scaring them, I'm about telling them what reality is. We're going to go to audience questions and invite uh, your questions for Roger, Jim, and Dusty at the microphone back there. You can briefly identify yourself, and we have. Uh, a few minutes left, we'll get through as many questions as we can. Um, if you're just joining us, we're talking about pro sports and climate change with Dusty Baker, the professional baseball manager and player. From Joining us from Louisville, Kentucky is Roger McClendon, executive director of the Green Sports Alliance, and Jim Thompson, founder of the Positive Coaching Alliance. I'm Greg Dalton. Welcome to Climate One. Hi, uh, my name's Peter Gisela. I'm a Vietnam era veteran. In 78, I took an environmental class and learned about global warming. In 1980, in San Jose, I got some coverage for a proposal for a youth energy core nationwide based upon a bill that was in the Congress. And for 40 years now, I've been talking about this and nobody's really responding. I hope to share some information about this with you and you can respond and maybe share it with your colleagues. Two years Thank ago, you. Senator McLean got a commission set up to look at challenging youth to get involved in service activities, be it community service, AmeriCorps, or military service. And they're looking at a proposal for next year to Congress on how to invigorate civic dialogue among each new generation. And that's the information I want to give to you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, the, um, the, the new Green New Deal hasn't been fleshed out, but one part of the Green New Deal is jobs. And you know, nuclear energy, uh, fossil fuel energy are very job non-intensive. If you're talking about putting solar panels all across this country, lots and lots of jobs and good jobs. And I love your idea of a uh, you know, civilian conservation corps. I read something recently about uh, some, some people in a European country, I forget which one, but they planted a billion trees. We need mm -hmm. trillions of trees. What if we had a program that took 20 or 30 or 40 or 50,000 kids from inner city LA and other cities around the country and put them in our national parks, put them, uh, you know, uh, planting trees, doing the things that need to happen, uh, that could be very exciting. And these, these kids then are getting training, they're part of a team, they get done with their service, they go back into the, the uh, economy. This could be one of the greatest things that could happen to us. Great, welcome to Climate One. Thank you, uh, my name is James Goldwyn, I'm a policy analyst. And this question is for Dusty in particular, but I would like to hear some of uh, what the other panelists have to say about this. So, um, you know, the Giants have received the Green Glove Award from Major League Baseball for the past nine years in a row uh, for sustainability. And that sounds great, uh, except none of the other 31 Major League franchises have ever even been considered for this award. Um, you know, my, my vision of a ball game, right, when I, whenever I go to what's now Oracle Park, it's foil wrapped hot dogs, it's plastic beer cups, uh, seagulls. Um, and you know, these are pieces of trash that are bought at the rate of tens of thousands per game, mm -hmm. right? And they can very easily be replaced with compostable alternatives, mainly paper. Um, so my question is, uh, you know, these are really tangible steps that we can take to reduce the carbon footprint of the game. But uh, what are some other steps that Major League Baseball, you know, either at the commissioner's office or, you know, the players in the dugout uh, can do to really um, sort of get the conversation moving in the right direction and bring in some of these other franchises and fan groups towards uh, our overall efforts of uh, stemming climate change? Thank you. We'll let Dusty swing at that. Yeah. And that's really where Rogers works, too. Right. I mean, that was a great question. Um, you know, I think that we have to start, like I said, through education, uh, you know, number one. 
I, um, I remember I was in Cleveland probably about 10 or 12 years ago, and they had like a, this uh, solar contraption up on the, up on the um, stadium. Yeah. Up on the stadium. And I was mm -hmm. like, man, what is that? And, uh, and they've hence taken it down. But I mean, I think we can start with LED lights. I think we can start with solar, uh, uh, you know, on, or, or even some form of, uh, you know, cogeneration, you know, to save, you know, to save some energy. Um, I think uh, uh, when the stadiums really uh, come forward and do something about it to, to you know, to, to bring about awareness from everybody else that, that comes into that stadium to notice, um, I, I know it's just heartening to me because one of my favorite channels is, uh, you know, either History Channel or National Geographic, which I start st studying National Geographic when I was like 10 years old. My mm -hmm. mom went out on the limb and, and, and when I look and see how much plastic is in our ocean or, or you know, how we're, you know, uh, just, just screwing this whole thing up. Like I said, I, I can't stress the amount of, of education and we have to realize that money is not everything. Uh, you know, everything's not about uh, uh, money and making a dollar. I understand because I'm in business as well. But, you know, we have to take care of Mother Earth, number one. Yep. Roger, can you address the waste at stadiums? Yeah, absolutely. It's a very great, uh, great question from, from our audience. And, you know, in a lot of stadiums, they have zero waste uh, targets um, where they're trying to get to everything coming into that facility is reused or recycled are put back into uh, a positive use uh, stream. Uh, and many stadiums are successfully doing that. U.S. Bank Arena, when they opened up their stadium, they're now lead platinum with some of the advancements. And they have um, a 91% when they did the Super Bowl, that event alone, um, capture rate um, toward a zero waste uh, goal. So the, the way you do it is, you know, you have to invest. And so you try to get to uh, a neutral cost, but if you, even if you have to invest and spend more money, I think it's worth it for the branding that you get. And you have to look at what's coming in from your supply chain to make sure those materials are compostable. There's bioplastics through uh, companies that supply those materials for the simple fact of re reclaiming them and then putting them back into a compost system that can go back into uh, into the earth as reusable um, nutrients materials. So, so it can be done. Uh, so I think, you know, one, one opportunity for fans is to hold those stadiums and those teams accountable. You know, you know they, they look for that input. When the fans or the customers start saying this is important to them, then usually, you know, businesses start to listen, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, so I think that's the power of the fan engagement that we have. But I have to say there are some teams like, you know, um, Mercedes-Benz Stadium and Moda Center, uh, U.S. Bank Arena and others that are really taking this seriously and making operational changes uh, to make that happen. So that, that's just an update. You know, we had a, we had a player on our team in Cincinnati, young player from uh, Los Angeles named Chris Dickerson. And uh, he was the, the first player that I saw that turned, he's no longer in the game, but he turned a business into, into uh, collecting waste at, at, at all the stadiums. And... Uh, uh, you know, I was proud of him. And the second one that I met, you know, like I explained, was was young Matt Keel's son. You know, Shane Keel. So there are some 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 athletes out there that are that are trying to do something. Make a difference. Welcome to Climate One. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Uh, I'm Mark Drexler from Oakland, and thanks for sharing the comment about Darren too, because as a parent, that's really important to share the knowledge. Thanks. I have a suggestion and then a, uh, a question for you, Dusty. Mm -hmm. Number one would be uh, similar to the NFL that does cause for cleats, the baseball players at the end of the month of uh, August are gonna put nicknames. Instead, pick a player from each team to have climate on the back. They can be a spokesperson and they can work along with MLB and everything else. And also PCA could also be involved with that as a, as a partner and Green Sports Alliance. And my question is, you have the 89 team coming uh, to the reunion. I was in the upper deck at, um, at Candlestick during the earthquake and then we had to move in the city. Uh, when that occurs, what uh, former uh, player that you were a, a coach of, will you talk about climate change? Uh, probably, uh, probably Robbie Thompson and, and, um, uh, Will Clark, cause he's, you know, 
a big hunter, and uh, and believe it or not, probably you know Kevin Mitchell, because uh, he's from San Diego, and uh, um, <clears throat> you know that was a pretty uh, conscientious team. And I'm looking forward to seeing them. That's why we planned this today, so I can be here for the weekend, for the whole week. <laughs> 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 and uh, so, you know, I'm looking forward to the, you know, the 89 reunion. And I'll tell you a quick story. My daughter, I think she was in the sixth or seventh grade, and she was doing a book report on, on, on earthquakes. And I just talked to her the day before, and she said, Dad, do you know what you do in an earthquake? And I says, no. She says, well, you stand in the door well, or you get underneath something. And uh, uh, the earthquake was the next day. <laughs> and, and, and I was in the in lunchroom, and I went, and I stood in the door well, and I was eating some <laughs> banana nut bread, and everybody's like, hey, man, aren't you going to run? I'm like, no, nah, my daughter told me to stay still. <laughs> <laughs> Great, you can let yes, Jim Thompson. That, that's, I think, a great metaphor. Uh, I'm really excited about the Sunrise Movement, for example, which is 20 uh, year olds who are uh, leading this. And I think we're seeing more and more leadership and energy coming from younger and younger people. And too often, adults, we try to channel them or calm them down. No, we should be giving them money, you know, cheering them on, and um, and, you know, your daughter helping you out like that is a perfect metaphor. We thank need you. to learn from them. And yeah, because we, yes. yeah, welcome. Hi, thank you so much for your brilliant Step expertise a little closer. and contribution. My name is Allison Pobrislo, and I divide my time between climate and ski resort technology mm. um, and, and sustainability for resorts. Um, and um, we're launching a climate pledge platform that connects stakeholders um, businesses, governments, NGOs, individuals to pledge their their goals to um, for sustainability and and their pledges. Um, my question is, how do we galvanize all these entities and have them work together? And I think we're all speaking to the choir here, preaching to the choir, as far as everyone is on board here and everyone is interested. But um, you'd mentioned that some of the players, you know, they spend their lives; it's their life dream and 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 goal to be a player. Um, but if you look at someone like Greta Thunberg from Sweden, she's, she's um, protesting on Fridays and now there's hundreds of thousands of students because they feel they have no future. So mm. effectively it's really not, it's less about you know, what uh, us individually and, uh, and more about us collectively because Collect we really don't have long. Thank you. Roger, what are some of the sports that are hard to reach? Think about NASCAR, sports that are, that are I don't know, either more conservative culture or because fossil fuels is at the center of what they do. How are you reaching sort of those, those harder, harder reaches? Yeah, I think NASCAR, because of what they do, inherently seems to be a challenge. But, you know, e-racing e and, you know, looking at, you know, the electronic, you know, cars, uh, is kind of a growing opportunity, right? You have to regenerate your business model, you know, or you become a dinosaur. You know, if you don't think about the future and the implications of your challenges and your risks today, you won't be around tomorrow. So I think you can have honest conversations around the business model and, and challenge them. So NASCAR Green was in effect, and I think they're, they're wanting to re refresh that uh, and talk about it. But there are, you know, Sports that are leading um, that have been leading, uh, you know, from a social and environmental cause, USTA with, with the leadership of Billie Jean King and, you know, breaking that barrier around gender. I mean, the, all these things are kind of related. And they are some of those brands and leagues are at the forefront of the climate discussion. Uh, we do also have a pledge through the United Nations Sport for Climate Action where we ask folks and members of us to take a pledge. We did a webinar to educate them about what they can do, because I think the biggest challenge, even from a personal standpoint, is what do I really do to make a change and make a significant change? Uh, and so I think that's the, the educational part and electrification, getting out, off of fossil fuels, understanding the production and manufacturing systems across the country on, on raw materials and goods. I mean, we really have to go after what's going to have the most, the biggest impact as we start to think about this strategically, but bringing others along with us, especially folks that can help with policy influence, you know, when we go to the polls to vote, I think is the biggest weapon that we're, that we're going to be able to have collectively as we move forward. And the Golden State Warriors uh, signed that UN declaration on, on climate. I should mention that we invited Kim Stone, general manager of the new Chase Center for the Golden State Warriors, to join us today, uh, and she wasn't able to join us. Uh, last question. Welcome. 
Hi, uh, my name is Steve Hams. I'm a volunteer, have been for the last five or six years with Citizens Climate Lobby. And uh, CCL has been advocating for a uh, federal price on carbon for that uh, 10 years. And uh, time has finally come for that. Our bill was introduced at the beginning of this year, and four others were introduced a couple of uh, weeks ago. Um, I lead our business climate leaders. We work with businesses to join us in advocacy. And we've actually just recently started working with Roger and the Green Sports Alliance, which I'm really excited about. Um, I really love these, um, the ideas of getting major sports figures um, and teams to speak out about climate and climate policy in particular. My question is, rather than trying to reach them individually, is there an organization that you think would be, um, it's kind of like reaching the executives um, of a company, right? Do you think there's one of the organizations within sports, um, like the Players Union, for example, or... Um, leadership of one of the leagues that we could work with to really um, get behind this and and uh, uh, create an opportunity for their players or their um, or their um, employees to get behind something that they're advocating for. Thank you, Dusty. Who would That's players listen question. to? Yeah. Well, I think uh, uh, you know the players' union. You know, as you mentioned, would be a great place to start. But also, you have to start with Major League Baseball you know, on the other side. Because if one side does it, then the other side's gonna do it. They don't wanna be left out. <laughs> and there, but there are certain organizations that, that are more conducive, uh, you know, to believing in. I think the San Francisco Giants and Oakland A's, especially in the Bay Area and the open-mindedness of, of the Bay Area, uh, um, uh, you know, resonates uh, tons as far as uh, possibly getting something done. You know, there are other organizations but certain parts of the country are more uh, uh, readily acceptable to to the change that we're trying to make. Yeah, it, 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 it might be, you know, Steph Curry could come out on climate, but it, it means might be uh, received differently if someone from Dallas or the Midwest came out on climate. Right, and, and, and I'm sure there, there, there are people there too, but probably not the magnitude of the, of the ideas that we have here in the Bay Area, I think. Jim Thompson. I think... Uh, um, I think an area to look at is sports agents. Uh, a, a given agent may have 5, 10, 15, 20 players. Um, some agents, uh, I think uh, Lee Steinberg might have been, who's also involved with Positive Coach Lines, might have been one of the first that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you're going to sign with me, you gotta you got to put some money into something. So I think that's a fruitful way to... Uh, and then there are... You know, like uh, Roger, you mentioned LeBron and and his um, his uh, leadership and visibility. Um, that they'll, they'll, they, there can be then a, a kind of a, a tidal wave. That's a bad term, but uh, uh, if, if, the, if the right people, if the right people uh, take that leadership, uh, other people come in. I would I would think about the the agents. The agents have a lot of influence over the business and the brand of the, of their clients. Mm -hmm. We have to wrap it up there. I'd like to uh, uh, thank you all for for joining us and thank the Climate One crew. I get to sit up here with these fabulous gentlemen. But let's give the crew a round of applause for making today possible. Um, we've been talking. I like, like give him some some big time credit because I, I enjoy. Roger, to yeah. Roger. Oh, yeah, Roger, you're, you're, you're great. Oh, Jim and Dusty, we, we, this is not the last time we're going to talk. Man, no. we got to get together. <laughs> I know you send me an email every week. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining us. From, you know, we would have liked to have Roger with here with us, but it's less time and carbon and money for him to, to join us from, um, from, his, um, from his office there. We've been talking about how professional sports can be a player in climate change. I'm Greg Dalton, and my guest today were Dusty Baker, special advisor of the San Francisco Giants, who's been a player and manager in professional baseball for more than 40 years. Roger McClendon, joining us from Louisville, Kentucky, is executive director of the Green Sports Alliance, an association of teams and venues. And Jim Thompson, founder of the Positive Coaching Alliance, which trains youth and sports youth sports coaches around the country. Podcasts of this and other Climate One shows are available wherever you podcast. Please help us get more people talking about climate by giving us a rating or review. I'm Greg Dalton. Thanks for joining us, everybody. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks, Roger. Sun, I'll be sitting when the evening comes 
watching the ships Thank you. 